Welcome to Portland Rising, the monthly news, interview, and arts program brought to you by the Portland Phoenix with assistance from the folks at the Portland Media Center, and we're very grateful for their help tonight. Tonight we have candidates for the Portland City Council in the election that will be held November 2nd. Don't forget to vote. Right with me tonight, I have candidates for the at-large seat on the City Council. To my far left, I have Roberto Rodriguez and Brandon Mazur to, to his right and Stuart Tisdale. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And I'll start just, just going around, we'll just answer questions. Roberto, I'll start with you. What is your reason for running? What is the top item you would like to accomplish as a counselor? Thank you, um, and that's the fundamental question. Um, I think the short answer is that I love this city. Um, over the last five years, I've been serving on the school board, uh, and I've become passionate about the work that we've been advancing, a work that's grounded on equity. Our equity goal of our comprehensive plan calls us to root out ongoing inequities and systemic challenges. And the work that we've done by allocating resources and trying to combat that from the school level has been magnificent. But these problems are large societal issues that the schools cannot solve alone. So I'm eager to get into the council and be in a position where my impact could be broader um, and have a, you know, a, a stronger push to advance equity in our city. Okay. Brandon, same question. Yeah, um, thank you, Brandon Mazur. Uh, it's, a, it's passion for the city and affordability. Uh, I've spent the last four and a half years on the planning board. I've seen good development, I've seen bad development, um, and I'm hoping to bring my experience on the planning board uh, which implements the policy to really help address our affordability, affordable housing, family housing, public transit, the big topics that we really need to grapple with over the next three to five years as a city so that we can continue to prosper for all. Stuart, same question. Well, thank you. Uh, well, Portland is my hometown. Uh, I've lived here for 60 years. I'm the guy who still lives in the town where we went to high school. Uh, raised two children here. I've worked in the courtrooms of this city as a public defender. I've been in the classrooms as a history teacher, an English teacher. I see we're at a crossroads. So from, from my work as a lawyer, I, I know that good representation is essential. And I want to be the voice from the middle that uh, ensures that balanced community-based decision-making will be the top priority. And as a, as a history teacher, I, I, I must say that I also know that communities can thrive when they are together. They can have golden ages, even. So I want to be the voice that makes sure that the collective good is not derailed by the interest of, and the agenda of special groups. Thank you, Stuart. And we'll do the next question in the reverse order. What are the top qualities that the council should be looking for in a new city manager? What is your model for how that hiring process should work? Stuart. Well, uh, I would say the, the, the top quality has to be somebody who listens and listens to everybody, sees who they are, doesn't otherize people, and works towards pragmatic solutions. Top quality would be somebody who uh, this would be the quality that, that I would see for everybody in government, everyone, that they are like a teacher who stands in front of the classroom and knows it's his duty to meet the needs of everyone in the classroom to the extent that that's possible. So I would look for a uh, city manager that, that I could trust based on his resume and recommendations and everything that I, that could tr I could trust to be that kind of person. Thank you. Brandon? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I think we have to understand that the, the Charter Commission is currently looking at, at this issue and whether or not we have a city manager, whether how much power that city manager may have. Assuming um, that we do continue to have a city manager, we need somebody without an agenda that can come in, that can get uh, very detail oriented with uh, management of staff, uh, guiding the, the mayor and the council on budgetary processes, and make sure that uh, the day-to-day -day business of the city gets done in a responsible way. Right. Roberto. Um, I would look at a lot of the positive experiences that I've had working as an elected official with the superintendent who has a very similar position as the city manager has. Um, and the process that the school board went when they hired the superintendent, which was a transparent process that included public input. Um, what I'm most proud of, the relationship that we've had with the superintendent, is our ability to stick to the comprehensive plan and be able to guide all of our decisions, be it policy making or budget allocations, to that comprehensive plan. And as I said earlier, that comprehensive plan is centered on equity, and that's how we've been able to be so successful, by having aligned visions. So that's what I would look for in a manager, one that shares the same vision to, serve, to solve the problems that we've all highlighted are critical in our city, affordability and equity. One of the major problems in the city, and we'll start with you, Roberto, is the lack of housing for the middle class and workforce. What steps should the city take to solve this problem? So I think, first of all, it's important to acknowledge that it's not a problem unique to Portland. It's a problem that we're seeing throughout the state and throughout our country. And so, again, broad impact is what we need to be uh, looking for as, a, as an outcome. And so I believe that right now when, with the state uh, committee to look at the gap in, in housing, it's important that we could collaborate with them and we identify ways that the whole state can bridge the gap. Um, in short, here locally, we need to work hard and aggressively to rezone and allow for multifamily development to take place. And we need to eliminate a lot of the barriers that, ha that are in place for developers to, to jump in into these opportunities. Brandon. Yeah, I think uh, there are a lot of tools within the, the city's tool bag that we can use to help uh, address some of our affordability issues. Uh, one of the biggest processes going, uh, taking place right now is Portland's recode phase two. We are doing that work looking at uh, the different zones, up zoning, down zoning. Uh, we can get aggressive on our core corridors, the Forest Ave, the Brighton Ave, where there's one, maybe two story buildings where we could see some density. And since they are on core transit corridors, we may be able to lower some of the parking requirements because people will be able to get around. Um, smaller lots, which gets back to some of the zoning issues. Um, and then, although the, the Green New Deal affected the inclusionary uh, zoning ordinance, we can do quite a bit by incentivizing with our public uh, housing trust fund. We just saw CHOM do two great projects over at the Mercy Hospital process for elderly housing and family housing, and we were able to subsidize that with some of the funds in our trust fund. So. Uh, just continuing to, to look at the new tools that we have at our, our disposal. Well, I, I agree. We need, we need to rezone to, to allow multifamily housing, and especially off the peninsula. I mean, th there are huge er areas of, of Portland that have, that have small single-family houses with, with really big lots, and, and, and we, need to, we need to rethink that. On the, on the major avenues, I agree with that completely. W with regard to the... Uh, I, I think we shouldn't let, let the, the developers who are doing the big developments buy their way out of including affordable units in their projects. I, I, I don't think we should allow them to opt out by paying because they're just going to opt out, pay it, build a, 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 luxury, a luxury unit and still be able to sell it with people come in from, that will come in from out of state with out of state money, which everybody knows is bigger than in-state money. Um, so I, I think, I agree, zoning, and I would not let the developers opt out of affordable units. And I might change the definition of affordable unit, too, so, so that it, it allows working people and you know, just beginning professional people to be included. Right. And we'll start with Brandon on this one. Do you support the building of the large shelter out on Riverside? Would you support the building of smaller shelters? And how will you vote on the referenda on November 2nd? Thank you, yeah. This was uh, many years of work. So this process started back in 2016, 17, when I first joined the planning board, where we looked at the zoning. The short answer is yes, I support the, the shelter on 
uh, Riverside, but this isn't an either or solution. Um, what we have is an emergency shelter with wraparound services. Those services are going to be located all in one place so that uh, those experiencing homelessness don't have to run around the city to find their, the needs that they have. Mental health, uh, central health care, uh, social services, job training will all be at one central location. Now, does that mean we shouldn't do other shelters? There are a lot of shelters um, and support services in different neighborhoods, uh, domestic abuse, women's shelters, family shelters. So um, I will be voting neither uh, on, on the referendum because there's an A, B, or C. Um, but the conversation needs to continue. I think some of our definitions can be made, made better. Um, but this, this shelter is needed. We have uh, a population that needs help now, and to delay it would be irresponsible. Okay. Stuart, same question. Well, this is a, this is a really complicated question, and, and I, you know, I've been going this way and that way on this question. Everybody, I, every expert, ostensibly knowledgeable person I talk to opens a new vista on this issue for me, and I, so my head has been spinning. But I, I, I think now, I think I'm fairly settled on the idea that for the solution to be coextensive with the problem, or as close to coextensive as possible, ultimately the solution has to be regional. It has to be a state level regional solution. And it shouldn't be Portland's dime that's paying for a solution that is really caused all across the state, and even outside the state. So I look at this shelter referendum as, as a, a short, it's a short term, I mean, ideally, what it would be, and I would advocate for this, I would use every agency of advocacy that I had at my disposal as a city councilor, but ultimately the, the decision has to be, the solution has to be statewide and regional. There is a state initiative uh, underway to, to accomplish that. Depending on who you talk to, some say the fund, some funding has started, some, but other people say it hasn't started, but be that as it may, the solution has to be regional. So for the short term, I am favoring A, the small shelter. Okay. Roberto. Yeah, I am, so when I look at this issue, I rely heavily on my background as a health clinic clinician, particularly working home health here in Portland. I've worked with a lot of our previously unhoused um, members of our community. And what I want to focus on is continuity of care, quality of care, and access to high quality care for, for our unhoused members. Often, that's, that's where things fall apart when you have to send someone to the hospital because either their, their blood sugars are out of control, blood pressures are out of control, some other medical issue, and then the entire plan of, care, plan of care falls apart. And then we have to discharge someone, ER doctors have influence into med profiles, and all, everything goes out of whack. We lose track of people. Continuity care is what we need to worry about. How do we keep people engaged in their care, and how do we keep clinicians and interdisciplinary teams communicating clearly about the needs of these folks? And that's going to be the case whether we have a 200 bed shelter or multiple small shelters. Quality of care and continuity of care should be the focus of our communication. Okay. Next question. We'll start with you, Roberto. Just in the last two weeks, the city's politics has been awash in accusations with resignations from the school board by two members who criticized what they said was a divisive atmosphere. What is your reaction to these events and how can this atmosphere be improved? It's a great question, and it's, and it's a question that I'm intimately familiar with. I can tell you that over the last five years on the school board, as I said earlier, we started to tackle some long historical issues that honestly had not been approached with the sense of urgency that we had. And we expected there to be a pushback very similar to what we're seeing now. When we start asking hard questions and having hard conversations about race, about equity, about white supremacy, about what we called an impenetrable wall of whiteness. That's a quote and a theme that came out of a report that had the most comprehensive look at the experiences of our BIPOC staff members. It literally interviewed every member of our staff, and those were the themes that, that, that came up. An impenetrable wall of whiteness and the smog of cultural racism. So I believe that if, if we don't focus that as, as a starting point of every conversation, we're gonna miss the mark. And unfortunately, when we've done that, people have perceived it as divisive when in fact it's just a really difficult conversation to have. Right. Brandon. It is divisive, um, and I'm hoping to bridge that gap. This uh, us versus them mentality doesn't solve our affordability problems, doesn't help our homeless population, doesn't get better public transit. Um, we, we need to 
work as a city as a whole uh, and listen to all ideas, uh, whether we agree with them or not, um, there's, there's a difference between disagreeing and not listening. And I think we really need to get back to the core city politics of addressing all of our needs as a whole. And we need to work as a we, not as an us versus them. Okay. Stuart. Yes, I, I'm, a, I'm afraid it, it is divisive. I'm, I'm afraid it's coming across as divisive. And uh, I, I don't like it when I, when I hear that because I, I, I also, I'm sure, I'm sure, I, I'm sure I, I, teach, I know teachers and, and teachers are absolutely dedicated towards seeing everyone succeed. That's what they get up in the morning and go to work for, is to see everybody succeed. Uh, so, you know, when I, when I read how our test scores are so low compared to uh, Lewiston or Westbrook or South Portland, uh, impoverished wh white students and, and black and brown students, I mean, I, I, I'm appalled at that. Th that needs to be fixed and every resource available needs to be put in to fixing that. But I, I just can't believe it's the teachers because teachers are generous of spirit. That's what they get up in the morning to do is to help people. So if there's some other problem in the system, just call it to people's attention and I'm sure they'll fix it because everybody in education wants the kids to succeed. That's why they go into it. Okay, thank you. That was back to some some maybe quicker questions. Um, and I'll start with Stuart. Would you have voted for the mask mandate that was recently rejected by the council? Why or why not? And this could be a pretty brief answer. Yeah, uh, I would have, uh, I would, where the mask mandate just was Portland, only Portland, I would have, I would have uh, 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 said no. No. I would have also said no without some sort of better metric that would show when it would come back uh, to not having a mandate. Uh, the, the results we're getting from the CDC are, are grouped, our hospitalizations are regional. So without a better um, metric, I, I would have been against the mask mandate. Roberto. I would have supported the mask mandate. Uh, wearing a mask is a risk mitigation strategy uh, and it's something that you do to prevent the numbers from rising. So to wait for things to get worse before you implement it seems counterproductive. Okay. Um, Brandon, I will start with you on this one. Um, Portland spent a lot of time and effort on the Racial Equity Steering Committee in the wake of the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests. Which, if any, of the committee's recommendations should the city council adopt? And I realized from a previous interview that they may not be top of mind, but of course, uh, they wanted to strengthen the Police Citizen Review Subcommittee. They wanted to um, <clears throat> to hand off some of the responses uh, to mental health workers and, and as in, lieu of, uh, in lieu of police response. You probably remember most of them, but if that helps. So. I, it, it does help, and I'll, I'll try my best. Um, I, I had friends that served on that committee. Uh, I respect the work that that committee did. Um, I think the recommendations of uh, shifting um, the oversight committee uh, makes a lot of sense. I think um, putting resources towards mental health is uh, a huge need. Um, so I, I don't want to say that I would, would have supported all of them because to your point, I, I'm not sure I remember all of them, but the key points, um, I, I think the work was incredibly important and we should seriously look, and I believe that the Charter Commission is going to be looking at some of these things as well and I look forward to seeing their, their work. I think that's right. Roberto. Um, yes, I, I, I appreciate and I think that the, the work of the <coughs> steering committee was incredibly important and it was part of the commitment that the city made to address uh, problems of inequity in our city. Um, I think that the Citizens Review uh, Committee is the, the most obvious example of the recommendations that we should follow. Um, and that's, again, uh, in an effort to bring transparency into our governance, transparency into the services that we provide our citizens. Stuart. Uh, yes. I. Uh I would absolutely, totally in favor of, of mental health, of having a mental health team involved with the, with the police. That, that, should be, uh, that should be implemented immediately. Uh, so yes on that. On, on, the, on the police review, that, that, that's a little stickier for me because I, I think w would I want a board of non-teachers to judge me as a teacher? or would I want a board of non-lawyers to judge me as a lawyer? 
I think the voice of a non, uh, a citizen voice or two is important to be on, on those review panels. But it needs to be a majority of police who are on the review because they know, and you have to I assume they're operating in good faith, and they want to stamp out uh, bad policing as, as for the good of the community as much as any, anyone else does. But they know the subtleties, because you don't really know all the variables of a job unless you're in the shoes of, of somebody to do it. And I've, I've, I mean, I used to sue the police I, a, a, on occasion when I, when I had a case. I, I, I brought a number of police brutality cases, some even against Portland. And I used to, used to sue the, the Department of Corrections for brutality against the inmates in the prison. So I, I, I'm not interested in whitewashing anything, but I just think it's fair. It would be unfair to have a review panel made up of non-police, or, or, or not a majority of police. I have to trust they're in good faith. Okay. Next question, start with Stuart. Are you satisfied with the city's ranked choice voting system? Or in light of this year's charter commission election, where a commissioner who trailed badly in the first tally was ultimately elected, do you think it should be revised or revoked? Hmm. Well, you know, as a, as a candidate in this election, I'm, I, I'm looking at that very, very hard. As a citizen, I, I was halfway, I was, I was not so bad, because I, I thought it would encourage moderation in candidates. Because candidates, if they did, they would they would try to play for if I can't be your first choice, then I could be a second choice. That that, that might uh, encourage moderation in candidates. Uh, but I'm, uh, and the charter commission election was fluky because 84 percent of the voters stayed home. So I'm not sure that was a charter totally a charter commission. I mean, a uh, totally a ranked choice voting. Uh, I'm going to say right now that I'm trying to work with it. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Uh, I generally support ranked choice voting. I do think uh, with, with what we saw with the Charter Commission in that very specific election, uh, we learned that there were some weaknesses. When you have uh, multiple openings with multiple candidates, it, it, I think it worked the way um, we had drafted it, but not how we maybe intended it for a situation like that. So I think in that situation, we may want to look at tweaking it and either doing uh, each round, each seat uh, as a ranked choice or not have such a high threshold at 51. If you have four open seats, really that threshold probably should have been 25%. Um, but overall, I think ranked choice does give people the option um, and, and I am supportive of it. Okay. One last question. The city of Portland, and we'll need answers briefly, and it's a very big question. So the city of Portland is threatened by climate change. I don't need to tell you the effects, so I'll abbreviate the question. What steps should we be taking to address this problem? Roberto. Um, great question, and I think it's one of the most pressing issues that we have to deal with, and there's so many areas that we can have an impact. I think that the, the most quick and, and immediate thing is to continue to lower our, our carbon footprint in the city and to lower our emissions. And there's, there's work in, in, in the way, we just need urgency behind it. But again, it's like many of these other issues, it's not unique to Portland, so we need a broad coalition of folks. We need to work with folks like the Maine Conservation of Voters Fund who have been doing advocacy and holding people accountable for years. I think that we follow their lead and we use partnerships. This is a problem that's gonna impact all of us, particularly our youth. Okay. Brandon. I think it uh, goes back to one of our original answers. Zoning can have a huge impact. We need to anticipate rising sea levels, uh, incorporate uh, electric vehicle charging stations, solar panels. Um, we also need to support uh, regional initiatives. They're looking at funding uh, dredging the harbor, and that could open up an amazing 25 to 40 percent, depending on the war, for, for our working waterfront, which uh, will also help. So really looking at broad scope and, and tools that we can encourage people to, okay. to continue to attack our climate change. Okay. Stuart? I think think very creatively about how we can use mass transit more effectively because, okay. because uh, you know, car emissions are a big cause of pollution. That's a very good point. Well, we've come to the end of our, our time together. I want to thank you all very much, Roberto, Brandon, and Stuart, uh, for for being here with us tonight and for, for putting yourselves forward to run for council in the city of Portland. It's a, it's a great thing to do. And if you'll stay with us, we'll be right back with our district candidates.
Now we're back with the candidates for the district races for the city council election on November 2nd. For district one, we have Sarah McNevich and Anna Trevorrow will join us via Zoom. And for district two, we have John Hink and Victoria Pelletier. John, I'll start with you. What is your reason for running? What is the top item you would like to accomplish as a counselor? Good evening. I, I think the, um, the reason I'm running is because I have uh, some, something to offer to the city that uh, I really greatly love and appreciate. Uh, I have served previously for three years. I bring a bit of experience, uh, but I'm still ready to help make uh, significant change. And right now, one of the biggest things that we face is the cost of living, the cost of housing in this city. And I would like to be part of uh, tackling that uh, difficult challenge. I think it'll need a lot of different uh, approaches and a lot of different solutions. When I previously served on the council, I uh, helped get us inclusionary zoning. And that's just one little, uh, little development that is helping uh, to some degree, but we need to do more. Thank you. Victoria, same question. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I love Portland. I love living here. And so I think because of that, I want to be in a position where I can give back as much as I can and I can really tackle some of our issues. And affordable housing, of course, I think that's everyone's issue. And I think that that is a huge piece of, of what we're trying to solve so that we can continue to live and work in Portland. And I'm somebody that lives in Parkside and I'm somebody that is continuously concerned about whether or not I'll continue to be able to live here in Portland. And so I think it's really important that we're electing leaders that are actually living the issues that we're trying to solve and being able to speak to it from a personal perspective when we're bringing solutions to the table. Excellent. Sarah. Yeah, so I'm running for District 1 because I feel like we need good people with balanced perspectives to step up and, and take collaborative work into their hands and um, really focus on creating balanced solutions that are proportionate to Portland's needs. Um, I've been advocating for my community in Bayside for the past five years, and there's pretty much no area of, um, of, of city issues that I haven't touched in that way. And that's given me the opportunity to work with the city and the city processes on almost every level. Um, and so I've been able to see some of the deficiencies and the strengths in how we, how we conduct our business. And I think the number one priority for me is uh, getting our arms around how popular we are. We need, to, we really, we just need to get a grip on our own popularity and how to keep Portland livable for the people who make it popular. We need to make it possible for people to uh, live, work, raise families, and age in place in Portland. And um, the, th the three words that come to my mind are keeping it um, you know, affordable, livable, and sustainable, and in all, all the aspects that go along with those three words. Anna. So my reason for running, I now I have eight years of experience on the serving on the Portland School Board. Prior to that, I was on the Charter Commission in 2009, and so I think I have um, almost a decade now of skills and experience to bring to the table, and I'm hoping to use that to work on a number of key issues. I think the biggest issue um, I'm hearing about, I think is kind of obvious to everybody, it's housing affordability. Portland is undergoing some rapid changes and becoming a place that's more challenging for the working class. And, even people making um, professional level salaries to be able to afford. And I want Portland to be a place where people can both live and work. Okay, um, starting with you, Sarah. What are the top qualities that the council should be looking for in a new city manager? Mm -hmm. What is your model for how that hiring process should work? Right, so I think the top qualities absolutely need to be professionalism and transparency and, um, and really strong communication skills. Uh, you know, it's, there's so much interface between the departments and between staff and counselors and being able to, um, you know, run that system in a way that allows for dialogue is incredibly important for keeping everybody on the same page uh, and keep us heading forward in the direction that we, 
intend to go um, per the council's goals mm -hmm. and uh, the comprehensive plan. And that process uh, to me, I, I think the, one of the key components is having citizen involvement, having um, neighborhood involvement. A, a member of the, the neighborhood association I'm part of it, participated in the hiring process for the previous city manager. So um, just in hearing how, how that worked, it, it just made a lot of the sense in the world to me to have people at all of the levels that the city manager interacts with be at the table, and that includes constituents. Right. Victoria. Yeah, I think we a great city manager is going to be somebody that understands the what happens when a large town actually turns into a city. And so the city manager really needs to understand that process because Portland I think of as a as a large town and now we are turning into a moderately sized city. And I think it's really important that the city manager is somebody that's going to keep the city equitable and not just kind of using that word because I know that it's extremely popular but making sure that we're pushing with that with the laws and the policies that we're putting into place and also making sure that Portland can remain a city for everybody because I know that we have a lot of people that are working class, essential workers and service industry folks that are the backbone of the city. And so as popular as we are, I really wanna make sure that we are also advocating for the people that have been here and wanna to continue to live here and raise families and put down roots. And I also think that the a uh, conversation around hiring a city manager should be community-based. I do all of my work with community as a community advocate and as, as somebody that is really championing other people to get involved in local issues. And so I think it's really important that if the city manager is going to be somebody that's leading the city of Portland, that the people of Portland who live here have a say in the process, understand the process, and that we're very transparent about how we're going about electing a new person. Well, I actually was co-chair of the last superintendent search committee, and so I have some experience in hiring executives. And I think that we did, uh, uh, I'm pretty proud of that work because we hired for strategic vision. And when Superintendent Botana came on board, the first thing that he did was to get uh, the entire district from all areas um, coalesced around a vision. We kind of looked at, well, who are we? as a district and what are our values? And we built a comprehensive plan around that with some key concise goals. And that became the driving force of all the work that we do. So I would be looking for a city manager that has those qualities to be able to do that assessment of who are we as a community in Portland? What are our values and how can we bring those together to shape the work that, that we're facing. Right. John. Uh, this is obviously a very important role of the city council. We'll be getting a city manager to uh, be in charge. Uh, of course, with the Charter Commission underway, we're not sure what the future uh, organization of our government will be. Uh, so it adds some complexity to the decision uh, nonetheless, uh, there are certain skills we want to get, whether it's an interim city manager or long-term city manager. Uh, I think the core competency of running a city our size is number one. Uh, someone who has experience delivering uh, services or being part of a team that delivers services, uh, preferably uh, someone who's been a city manager elsewhere. Uh, but then uh, other issues um, are also important. Uh, we would like a city manager who recognizes what uh, the residents of the city of Portland uh, think is important. And uh, that is uh, where a process that brings in community involvement would be very, very helpful. Uh, you know, we have a number of uh, uh, challenges that there's some consensus on uh, affordable housing. We want the city manager to understand how important that is. Um, fixing the, uh, the lights on the peninsula and elsewhere. Um, of course, making sure the snow is, uh, is, is picked up, um, but also uh, moving a city to being more uh, pedestrian and bike friendly is something many people in Portland agree with. I could go on, probably you don't want me to, no. <laughs> but um, these are the kinds of things that uh, city, councilor, city councilors and uh, community members would convey to candidates when they come in and that's an important part of the process. Following up on the same question and um, 
in a little different way. We'll start with you, Victoria. Are you in favor of giving more executive power to the mayor as, as opposed to the city manager? Uh, I am, and I know that the Charter Commission <clears throat> is discussing that. I think that there's an interesting power balance between the city manager and the mayor, but I am in favor of the mayor ultimately having the power and doing a strong mayor system versus a mayor and city manager system. I think it's really important uh, in the reflection of the city and, and, like I said, how we're distributing power. And so, again, I think that is a perfect example of a community conversation about what what are we being served if we have a city manager and a mayor? Are they working to look together collaboratively? Do they both have different agendas? And I am definitely in favor of, of a one mayor, no city manager system. You know, I was on the Charter Commission back in 2009. And of course, um, at that point, that's when we came up with the structure that we have now. Back then, the, uh, you know, the impetus behind an elected mayor was really that there was a sense that there were all these sort of projects that got started and then kind of got put on the shelf. Um, and so we were looking for somebody who would kind of move the ball on um, policy priorities. And I think that, um, you know, we, I think the kind of compromise position that we have now is better than what we had before because it does have accountability, but, um, it, it, it didn't quite meet the goal of giving the mayor enough tools to be able to move those visions forward um, that we had talked about. So my leaning is yes, I would be in favor of um, giving some more authority to the mayor, some more executive roles, uh, probably removing the mayor from the council into an executive position. Um, and when you do that, you know, it's the more authority you give the mayor, it, the more administrative the manager becomes. Um, so it wouldn't entirely eclipse the, uh, the manager position. I think that would still be a significant role for the city, but um, it would allow the, the mayor to have kind of the first, the first crack at the budget, for example. Um, because ultimately, the budget is a policy document that reflects the values of the city. Sarah. Yeah, so I, I tend to come down on the side of feeling that a professional city manager is the best way that we can get the business of the city done efficiently and effectively. Um, a city manager, such as the one we have now, uh, that's the person who is receiving reports, who understands what's what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, and so in terms of budgeting, they're able to really be fine-grained about where where resources should go. Um, I my concern with a strong um, may elected mayor is that there's more room for that to be a position that's influenced um, by one particular demographic, the vote, you know, the voters, the the. It's a position that is ostensibly answerable mostly to the voters who elected them. Um, and I think there's just a lot more room for, um, for it to be less responsive to the entire constituency. That said, I think there can be better communication and maybe you know, a little more transparency in the interplay between the two roles than we have now. Um, and <clears throat> and I, I think that's actually about it, sorry. Okay, <laughs> John. I have faith in our city and I think we'll do well regardless of which form of government we end up uh, choosing, uh, both the Charter Commission and of course the voters. Um, the Charter Commission is going to propose something and the voters are gonna decide whether that's implemented. Um, so I'm, I'm willing, uh, of course, to, to go with either approach. I did write an op-ed based on my own experience. I should say I've lived here for uh, 25 years, almost 26. And so I've seen the uh, strong manager system working here. And I think by and large, uh, it has over time worked fairly well. I also, in my lifetime, have lived in Philadelphia, Seattle, and San Francisco, all, all cities with strong mayors. And uh, sometimes they have good mayors. And sometimes they've had terrible mayors. And I wrote an op-ed on the experience of living in Philadelphia with Frank Rizzo, not only getting elected, but getting re-elected in a city that uh, was more diverse than Portland is today, 
perhaps more progressive than Portland is today, um, quite a revolutionary spirit, and nonetheless was led by somebody who um, uh, uh, had the lowest common denominator in his approach to the, uh, to the people of the city. Uh, so I have seen politics get subverted. Uh, so I'm not convinced that if we have a strong mayor that we'll um, always uh, have the best choice. Thank you. Just in the last two weeks, the city's politics has seen a swirl of accusations and there were two resignations from the school board by members who criticized what they called a divisive atmosphere. What is your reaction to these events and how can this atmosphere be improved? Sarah, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think it's, it's really unfortunate that it has come to that level of polarization. Um, I think it, it's very disheartening. I don't think that politics in a city like Portland should, um, should, should be that divided. You know, I, I, there seems to be a narrative now that disagreement means division and it, it shouldn't have to be that way. Um, I'd, I'd like to see people have more collaboration and balance and be able to, you know, give each other a path back toward the middle. And, and that's not what we're seeing right now. And I think part of the way that we get there is by, um, is by electing people who are willing to have the conversations and willing to have give and take and willing to accept imperfection and understand that you know, we're not all always going to get what we want, but we are all, as a city, trying to move toward a place where we're all doing better together. Right. Assume good intentions. Right. Victoria. Yeah, I think the word divisive is interesting because I think what people call divisive is, is just difficulty. It's just a difficult conversation. And to say divisive is, is kind of actively pushing a narrative that you know, people who have been historically undervalued and disenfranchised shouldn't speak up for themselves and shouldn't advocate for the needs that, that they require in order to feel like <clears throat> Portland is a city for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I, you know, when I see the word divisive, it's frustrating because I, I think it's really just hard conversations that we need to have that many of us said that we were ready to have, especially last summer with the murder of George Floyd. And so I think when you get into politics, but not just politics, just general life, I think that these hard conversations need to exist. We can't advance without them. We can't go forward without ag acknowledgement and accountability and also understanding. And to be to have a difficult conversation doesn't mean that it needs to, you know, be yelling or screaming or insulting, but it does need to have a level of accountability. It does need to have a level of understanding, especially when we use terminology like white supremacy and white privilege and equity and really people who are advocating for the things that they've never had. So, you know, I think it's extremely important um, to continue forward with conversations, even if they may be difficult, because if we're not going to do that, then I don't understand how we can advance together and come out on the other side together and really state that Portland is a city for everyone. John. Yes, um, Mary, do you mind telling me again how that question began? Uh, okay. Just in the last two weeks, the city's politics has seen a swirl of accusations, resignations from the school board by two members, who criticized what they called a divisive atmosphere. What is your reaction? How can this atmosphere be improved? Uh, I will say that uh, I have paid attention to those uh, events uh, as reported in the, in the newspaper, the uh, Portland Press Herald and elsewhere, and online. And uh, I probably will always pay attention to the cross currents. Um, but uh, I don't think they define us um, really, I um, see mostly people participating who care about our city. They care about objectives that they have and they would like to see play out. And um, I agree with Victoria that uh, these kinds of discussions can and, and should take place. Uh, we should be making sure that there aren't people who are frustrated because they haven't felt they have a voice. Um, uh, we want to have a vigorous debate, a vigorous discussion, and uh, I would also hope that uh, uh, in the end, uh, we would tend to come together. Anna? You know, my, I 
don't know that I can agree that my lived experience um, currently on the school board is that it is a divisive atmosphere. Um, I think that we are actually very focused on the Portland Promise, which is the district's comprehensive plan um, and the goals of that, particularly equity. Equity has been the driving force behind all of our policy making and all of our budget priority decisions for the last five years since we hired the, la the current superintendent. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. It's political season and um, people become uh, activated around messaging. But um, in my lived experience, I think we're actually very focused on significant and important priorities on the school board. Okay, different, uh, go, moving to a much different topic. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Victoria this time. Uh, fairly quick answer, I think. Would you have voted for the mask mandate that the city council just rejected? Yes, I would have. Uh, I think it's important that we continue to wear masks. We talk a lot about Portland being a very popular city. And so if we care about the city, we need to protect it and its people. And I understand that some people are going based off of the the low numbers, but I think if we're not wearing masks to prevent the spread and waiting for something to happen, that's an irresponsible thing to do to, you know, the people that you love in the city. Right. Well, yes, I would have. You would have. Well, I, we have, you know, I've, I've been to other cities over the summer. I've been to Boston. I've been to Hartford. Everywhere you go, um, they have indoor mask mandates. Um, and, you know, I, some cities are going as far as, you know, New York and, and Los Angeles now, I think, um, are doing vaccination mandates um, to get into basically every business. So um, I think that we need to, we have a responsibility to do everything we can to protect public health. Sarah. I think it would have very narrowly come down on the um, on unno, on simply because if we are the only ones doing it, it makes it very hard, I think, to um, to, to gauge wh whether that's what's having a positive impact or not on the numbers. You know, I think uh, we need more data um, and not so much regionalized data if we were going to make sense of the results of a mandate. John? Uh, yes, I'm uh, willing to back the decision that's uh, been made so far by the city council. Probably had they made the opposite decision, I'd say the same thing. Um, if I was making the decision, I would end up reviewing a lot more of the public health data that I assume was available to them, maybe available to me, but I have not been spending that much time with it. Uh, I'm a civil libertarian and I don't... Uh, encourage don't look for government mandates when they're not necessary on the other hand there's a, a balance an important balance here because it's a serious matter of public health um, so uh, it's a tough call and so far i see no reason not to uh, back the city council okay. portland spent a lot of effort and time on the racial equity steering committee in the wake of the 2020 blm protests which, if any, of the committee's recommendations should the city council adopt? And if they're not top of mind, uh, some of their recommendations included strengthening the police citizen, the public citizen police review committee, uh, using mental health uh, responders more than to substitute for some of the police responses, and a, and a whole, a whole suite of uh, proposals that are being considered by the council. So what is your thought and should any of those recommendations be adopted? Um, you know, I haven't, I can talk more generally about equity. I haven't reviewed all of the recommendations in detail. All of the recommendations. Well, one, uh, just to, just to um, maybe help uh, refresh, they wanted to strengthen the, you know, the Portland, uh, you know, the, the present committee that reviews the Portland and that's, you know, the Portland Police Review Committee, they wanted to strengthen that committee uh, and give it more powers to review the police, as well as trying to, to integrate new models of, of responding to certain incidents that would be more geared towards mental health, among other things, and many, many other uh, recommendations. I just didn't have them off the off the top of my head like that, but you, you did refresh my memory, and I, I would support those. Um, 
I, I would support, you know, um, putting a lot of weight into that um, report and um, really addressing equity the way that, that we ought to. Um, on the, the school board, we as a board underwent professional development around anti-racism and really looking at the ways that internal bias affects our policy making as um, elected officials. Um, I would love to see the city council undergo similar um, training and um, really commit to looking at every policy decision through an equity lens. Sarah. Well, I think the the office of um, it was like a, was it the office of racial equity? And I apologize if I'm getting this wrong, but within the city council that they proposed um, that I I was interested in that, but I wasn't sure where it might be redundant with the office of of, of uh, economic opportunity that we already have. Uh, so I was curious about that, but again, would want to know what would the differences be, and um, is it therefore necessary? The um, the police citizens review subcommittee um, that I, th I think it could be it, it could be changed because right now it, the their purview is to review internal cases um, and 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 how they were handled and not uh, the complaints themselves, which is a subtle distinction, but. Um, I, th I think it's very hard for um, a group of folks who don't have direct understanding of, of police procedure um, and uh, it, it, to make truly informed decisions. So I think you have to have a mix. You know, you do have to have um, law enforcement in that mix. But that said, citizen oversight is extraordinarily important. And we should continue to look at how to best serve okay. Portland with with okay. that um, right. that model. Now, the, the, but the one that I think is really interesting is this idea that we should add um, a mental health unit to the to the um, to policing, because I think a lot of people don't seem to know that we actually. We have that. We have had a behavioral health liaison, a substance use liaison. We now have a um, alternative response team. You know, the, all these things have actually been in place. Portland has been a model for that for a long time. There's always room for improvement, but okay. it's asked. It, it's said as if we're not doing any of those things, and we are, and we're very good at it. Okay, we, we're going to move through uh, this and a, a few other questions fairly quickly. Same question, Victoria. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think it was great that, that we had the Racial Equity Steering Committee, and I, I think that the Citizen Oversight Review is important, especially given the tension that was created, you know, prior to last summer, but definitely magnified last summer with the Black Lives Matter protests and the attendees of the protests in the police department. So I think that's important, especially for a city that wants to champion itself on leading with community. And that's the first step to leading with community. I also think that mental health services we can need to continue with this because we have a huge population of people that aren't being helped that aren't being treated that are unhoused and and i think just taking a one kind of like going forward with with thinking of one solution that would fit everybody is is not going to work and so i'm i'm very much in favor of the mental health services i'm very much in favor of making sure that we're treating every person with what they need and not just making assumptions and so i think that this oversight committee and i think that the mental health challenges or, or mental health support would be a huge help Thank you. John? Um, yes, I uh, hope that Portland can uh, always be in a place where we are uh, able to back our first responders because we obviously need to recognize that they do a difficult job. Uh, part of that is proper oversight. And I'm not uh, convinced that uh, historically we've had enough oversight. I think a citizen review committee over, doing oversight of uh, police is a very good idea, and I think they should have some actual uh, authority. Uh, perhaps uh, they would need to be trained a bit as well to serve in that role, because it's a very uh, significant role, and uh, it can cause difficulties and tension with the police, but um, it's needed. I also support uh, having more mental health professionals engaged in uh, first response uh, there are definitely times when the professionals that are called for are more in the mental health area than in the weaponized police area. And I'm not so sure that Portland has gotten that right consistently, and we should. Okay. Um, 
this is a big question, but we are going to be finishing up, so try to just hit some highlights if you can. Uh, Victoria, the city of Portland is obviously threatened by climate change. It's in a unique situation that's a vulnerable. What's your, what, what, could we, what should the city be doing? What specific steps should the city be taking to address this problem? Yeah, I, I think it's really important to, to mitigate climate change and to reduce our carbon emissions. But I also think we really need to start with education. I live in Parkside in a predominantly black and brown neighborhood. And that's arguably going to be the neighborhood that is the most impacted by climate sh change. And the same with the Bayside area and the same with the waterfront. And so I think taking an equitable approach to mitigating climate change is huge, not just making assumptions that we can just put more EV chargers around as if people can afford EVs. I think we really need to make sure that we're educating and make sure that we are leading with a community-based model to provide that education from city council to the people of Portland so that we can all work together to mitigate the change rather than just kind of using these high-level solutions without taking into consideration that there is a large demographic of people that are continuously forgotten about in these conversations and they're most often the most vulner vulnerable populations. Great. John. Um Top, top ideas for okay. what the city should be doing. I, I see it in two areas. I'd like to address both of them, but I'll try and do it quickly. Um, uh, one I call adaptation, and that's responding to climate change. And it has to do, um, for example, with flooding. Uh, we may also see the hottest days that uh, Portland's ever had. And uh, high heat uh, can often mean that people will die. Um, and we're not prepared. Typically, Mainers don't air condition. Uh, right. I've never had an air conditioner in this uh, city, and um, I'm not looking forward to the days when we may have to do that, but we also have to realize that some people are going to um, require extra help uh, right. to keep them alive if we have those kinds of days. Um, there's a lot more to say. I know there is a lot. But on <laughs> mitigation, um, uh, we need to do our part. We can't solve the climate crisis, okay. but Portland needs to do all it can to reduce its carbon right. footprint. Thank you. Yeah. Sarah. So the, yeah, basically we need to reduce our impact and mitigate the changes that we do have. There's a lot of little, low, middle, mid and high level solutions. Um, I think we've kind of touched on a few of them. We seem to be running out of time, so. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. Don't forget to vote on November 2nd. We have John Hink, Victoria Pelletier running in District 2, and Sarah McNevitt and Anna Trevaro running in District 1. So thank you all for joining us. Join us next month on Portland Rising, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you.